William, what are you doing? I'm making all these trees tropical. <laughs> we'll tell you an easier way to see tropical trees next on Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. You know, you can see real tropical trees when you join William and I in Hawaii this February of 2017. Now, we have talked about this before, but we wanted to remind you that it is the, the, the airfare is paid for, it's a seven day cruise included, and you're going to spend two full days in Waikiki. Plus, the benefit to all of us is that we're going to see wonderful tropical plants in all kinds of botanical gardens. Now, we're down to less than 10 spaces available, so please go to gardentime.tv and click on the tours link for more information and to sign up today. But coming up on the show today, we are at Sagawa's and we're going to be talking about fall color plants. But first, getting our fine feathered friends ready for winter. We all love to have birds in our backyards and it's the change of the season, so what are we going to do about bringing birds into our yards? I'm with Mitch at Backyard Bird Shops in West Lynn and so you have all the information, plus you gave me all these questions that keep me right on track. Thanks so much for the invitation out today. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming out. We're happy to have you. Thanks. So, so what do we do now? It is fall, so how has it changed for us for feeding the birds? Well, fall and winter are, are a colder, wetter time of year, obviously here in, uh, in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, and so uh, birds need to, uh, they're going to want more uh, types of uh, food because there's less natural food available out there for them. There are fewer insects, there are fewer flower blossoms and so forth. So we try to help them and supplement them with uh, feeding them in our backyards. And what kind of birds are going to be coming? Well, there are some migratory birds that we wouldn't otherwise see. A number of sparrows, golden crown sparrows, white crown sparrows, the Oregon junco, which comes down from the mountains um, in the, on the autumn and winter. And they're here for that period of time to get food where they can actually access it. And then what should we be using? Is it a different kind of seed this time of year? Well, um, it's the same kind of seed that we use all year long, but black oil sunflower seed really is the hands down favorite that we um, like to tell customers about. <laughs> and so this is a wonderful seed. It has a high oil content, has a very soft shell that um, perching, small perching songbirds can um, crack very, very easily and they love it. So we have some of the cleanest seed in the area. It goes through a process, a three-step process of being clean. So it's very, very high quality. We go through a lot of it and we also deal with our um, supplier directly. So oh, we have a very great. good relationship with them. And that's what we um, say is the first and foremost one to choose. And you have the black seed um, with the shells and without. That's correct, we do. We have um, something called the sunflower chips and these are right back here and it's out of the shell and it's just a cleaner way to feed and there's no mess of the shell on the you know fall, falling uh, um, below feeders. Some people don't like that and also that seed can germinate when it's in the shell and some people don't like that as well. So we offer different options for folks um, uh, with the black sunflower seed. Ah, and then what kind of feeders do we use? Okay, great, good question. So during the wet season and uh, rain and snow and so forth, we want to make sure that we protect the seed, whether it's in the shell or out of the shell. So this is a wonderful feeder that has a dome over it. It's a typical tube type feeder right here. And it's built specifically for small perching songbirds, as you can see by the size of these perches. And we put black sunflower seed in there. This dome protects it from getting wetter than it would otherwise. And there's a nice tray right here with drainage holes in it that also protects or keeps the seed falling on the ground as much as possible. This is an excellent combination setup right here that we offer at all of our stores. Very nice. Mitch, I see that you have some other type of feeders here. And what are these for? Oh, OK. So um, this is what we call a tray feeder. And it has a screen and welded wire mesh on the bottom. So this is a great feeder for offering seed like millet that I talked mm -hmm. about before and cracked corn to those ground feeding birds. So this is wonderful because it lets that water go right through and it keeps the seed as fresh and as dry as possible. You can also put a dome over this if you wanted to keep it extra dry. So All highly right. recommend that. I'll hold that one. And that's made out of cedar right there. That's nice. And, and what's that one? Yeah, this is a great feeder um, that we've carried for many, many years. And it's a squirrel proof feeder. Uh -huh. So this is. <laughs> yep. This is operated by weight. So once a squirrel gets on here, um, it closes these little ports or access to these ports. And but little birds are so light with their feathers and hollow bones that they can get on there and it doesn't <laughs> close that. So you can also put a little dome on here to keep it extra dry. And it's just as simple as that. 
and nice. this is a great little setup for um, keeping the squirrels out and feeding them elsewhere in your yard, perhaps, right, but catering to the to the perching songbirds. Ah, and I see another question on your list is about a roost, a roost feeder. No, I'm a sorry, roost pocket. a roost pocket. Yeah, exactly. And so what is that? So this is something that we've just started carrying the last couple of years, and it's really, really wonderful. And we've um, our customers like it for their birds as well. So really, it's a, a place for birds to take refuge during the inclement weather. Again, autumn, fall, and winter when it gets really blister, uh, uh, blustery. I should say <laughs> and cold and rainy they can go into this at night um, if you put it in a somewhat out of the way area and just take refuge from that weather so you can literally save lives by putting <laughs> little course. birds lives by putting this out and so um, it's a great uh, a great option for them and they come in different uh, oh, and they're so cute. Uh, natural uh, <laughs> natural materials so this has a little coconut shell on it right there so these are really really nice and a great addition to your bird friendly yard definitely yeah. And then what about suet? Because I know that that's a different kind of bird maybe to feed the suet to. Yeah, there's some crossover with suet. And so we have a, a lot of types of suet and there are some seed eating birds like chickadees and nuthatches and woodpeckers that will eat suet. But there's a lot of birds that are simply insect eaters. There are um, bush tits um, and some woodpeckers don't prefer seed. So they will come to this. So suet is a, a very um, cold, a great for cold weather feeding. It has a high fat content to it. And this one right here, our Backyard Bird Shop brand, has insects in it, dehydrated insects, <laughs> and a fat content between 80 and 98%. This oh. is high quality, and our customers say their birds go crazy over and good it. Good nutrition. It, yeah. And then what about hummingbirds? Because we have one that stays here all winter, don't we? We do have one that stays here all winter. It's called the Anna's Hummingbird, just a very, very cute little hummingbird. Um, and they readily come to feeders during the um, during the winter because, again, no um, insects or very few insects available, no flower blossoms. So if you want to have loyal birds come into your feeder, <laughs> this is really a time to invite them. And it's very, very easy with a simple um, sugar water mixture to have them come to your feeders. So we highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. It is. It is. Yeah. It is so much fun to have birds in our yards, even in the fall and winter. So if you have any other questions, please go to GardenTime.tv. We'll click you over to the Backyard Bird Shop website or come into one of their stores. They're all around the Vancouver and the Portland area. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Judy. Nice to see you. <laughs>Sugawa Nursery with Brian Sugawa and Brian you know you come in your front door your front gate and you're hit with fall color so really beautiful display and for us to talk about today. Yeah, now's the time fall color is happening fast but yeah right in front of us. Look you, at that. Isn't that nice that you have so many different variations you have the oranges dark red or I mean not dark red but don't you know, more of the darker oh, orange. burgundy. And this is a newer one, Autumn Embers, and it's a witch hazel, which right. I haven't heard of that one before. So it's nice, a new one on the market. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's, I think this is the first year we had it. But you know, Judy, what else is nice about these? You're going to get some winter color, too, for the uh, flowers, right around January, February, depending on when the weather corrects. Right. You'll get some nice little 
different colors, yellows, and there's some dark kind of orange colors, but yeah, really yeah, nice. Very nice, and crepe myrtles. I think every garden should have a crepe myrtle. This one here is uh, really nice. I like the dark foliage with the, you know, the, there's many different colors in crepe myrtles too. Paints, light pinks, and whites. So right, very nice. And they're turning lavenders. this kind of burgundy, kind of rustic, russet color. Yeah, new growth will have kind of a different variation on that. Kind of, you can see the darker color on that. And then really nice. for winter time, some winter interest on the bark? Winter interest is very nice. Actually, the bark will do, sometimes it does the oak exfoliation. Mm -hmm. It usually happens at an older age. Right. But, some, you know, that's what's nice. It kind of does this exfoliation, has that kind of a sh shiny, coppery appearance to it. Very so you nice. get that nice color in the winter. And then some new crepe myrtles. Look at the color on this. This is all year, all yeah. summer long, this Isn't dark, dark colored that's foliage. That's really dark. I've, it's kind of <laughs> it's new in the last black. three years. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Look at that. But uh, it's a hardier one, too, than the rest. I think it's like 10 degrees hardier, so it's wow. going to be really, uh, it's, again, another new one for us the last three years. But you can see that's, that's really dark foliage on it. And really, we grow blueberries for the fruit, but very beautiful in the yeah, fall. Yeah, isn't that something? I think we forget, you know, how <laughs> nice uh, the blueberries are just for the landscape purpose, you know, the fall coloration. You get the, you know, nice orange-red color on there. So it can almost go in the front yard, not just in the backyard in the in the front section. Definitely, I think so. Yeah, they're a good dual purpose plant. Definitely. Yeah. And Nandina, that's really an old favorite for us. I think so, because, you know, there's so many, they, get, they can start at 12 inches to six feet tall, a lot in between. But winter, as soon as that coolness happens, they really kind of strike up their nice, intensifies their orange red color. So yeah. it's one that, and they're evergreen, so they yeah. keep their leaves on, really easy to grow too. And this was unbelievable, this orange on this tree. What is it? This is Parodia. Wow. Here. I know, it just kind of, it just happened. Last, <laughs> uh, I'd say one week, you know, it's just mm -hmm. weird how, you know, one day we're summer and the next day we're, it's, <laughs> it's I know, it is. And the trees will let us know that. But you got the waxy, kind of the waxy foliage appearance. So it just kind of illuminates the fall coloration on that. You can see it's very nice. Most translucent. You can see through it. You got the just variation of everything in there. So. And pretty bark, too. Yes, it is. Really it's nice. It's one of our favorites. So. And I know we weren't going to talk about fruit, but we have to talk about this dogwood because there is so much fruit on it. Yes, it is. This uh, After the flowers, of course, that's how all the berries happen. But <laughs> you can see uh, just full of uh, nice little uh, ornamental looking fruit on there with this little spiky appearance like that. But it's uh, it's going to hang on for all the you know late fall and does really well for creating more color for the season. And you know, now the, the foliage seasons. is going to start turning too. So really, this is going to be coming in all year round. You're going to get think the flowers so. in the spring, yep. this beautiful foliage, and then fall colored foliage for the winter or fall, and then the fruits. Exactly. I just think the more uh, plants or trees can you know offer, the better it is. You know, it's hard to get seasonal interest and in color throughout the year. So. But That's it does it, if you come here, I think you have it all right here in this display. Yes, yes, <laughs> it'll be all right here. So yeah, it is it's that, that time, you know, when falls here. It's wonderful. <laughs> so you really have to come up to Sugawa Nursery, talk to Brian and his staff, and find some of these beautiful shrubs to put in your yard for fall and winter interest. Thanks so much, this Thanks. is a great display. Thanks. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Buying a new vehicle should be something you look forward to. So when you come to Capital Subaru, bring your pup, practice your swing, go for a walk, and relax. Our personally tailored service makes it easy for you to find your ideal Subaru. While you enjoy the service, selection, and amenities you simply won't find at any other dealership. Now at Capital, save $3,500 off MSRP on all new 2016 Subaru Legacy 2.5i's and 0% APR for 63 months plus two years complimentary service. Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Ten days, nine nights, eight gardens, seven nights on a cruise ship, six days in port, five days of private tours, four islands, three internationally recognized gardens, two nights on Waikiki Beach, and one great trip with your Garden Time gang. Travel with William and Judy on our next Garden Time tour this February in beautiful Hawaii. Book by October 15th and save $100. Go to gardentime.tv slash tours for all the details. Take the hard work out of yard work with the leaf hopper. The leaf hopper, the ultimate garden cleanup tool. Simply fill, fold, and funnel your yard debris away. 
It eliminates the back-breaking work of garden cleanup. When you are done, you can even use it to apply garden mulch in a precise area. Made from permeable material, it resists mold and mildew and folds away for easy storage. Get the leaf hopper at Quality Garden Centers or at EasyHallTarp.com. Well, we all know that fall is for planting, and especially bulbs that will bloom in the springtime. I'm with Donna Wright from Black Gold, and Donna, you have a great project to incorporate bulbs that will bloom in the spring in our containers in the fall. Yes, definitely. And it, it also is great for people that have apartments or condos that yeah. don't have a lot of space. Sure. You can do a pot, and it will have spring color later on. And you know, whenever I do this, I always am so surprised in the springtime because those bulbs come out, and it's like six months later, and it's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about it. So it's a nice added bonus. It is, it is. So what we're we're going to do today is we're going to layer bulbs, Judy. All right. We're going to start with soil in here and then we're going to start with one layer of bulbs and then add soil and make another layer of bulbs. Okay, and this type of soil that we use today is black gold, but it's one that's, that has some organic material in here so it helps nourish those bulbs all right. winter long. Yeah, you don't want to over fertilize your bulbs, so uh, using the natural organic works out well and it's got good, good drainage for. Uh, this out in the weather, it'll be perfect for your uh, spring bulbs. All right, and so we're going to start with these red tulips. And what are the, some of the tips when you're doing these bulbs in containers? Okay, so I, it, for people that are new to bulbs, they have a little nose and they have a little they have little feet. <laughs> so always the nose to the sky. Okay. And that's how you place them in. And what I do in my uh, container is start with the tallest ones in the middle. Okay. And so you have height in the middle, and then you're going to do the shorter ones on the outside. Excellent. So okay. let's go ahead and put those in. And just lay them on top of the soil you have prepared. And I think too, don't let them touch each other. Right, keep them a couple fingers apart, will work good. Yeah, and so we want that many or a couple yep. more? Nope, that's good. All right. And then we'll go ahead and add a little bit of soil. soil on the top. And then do we have to worry if, if sometimes they get on top of each other, is that going to be bad? No, they'll come up right through each other and right through the plants that we're going to put on the top. Oh, so even the plants, even though they have root balls? Yep, Excellent. and it'll be great. So we can put these around the edge. Okay, and these are daffodils, so they look a little different, but they still have those noses and those feet. Yep. And these are also still tall. These are really nice. And I think coordinating the colors is fun, or you can just kind of put any kind of colors. Yep. It's, it's all beautiful in the spring. Whatever your preference is. I think what we're using today is we're using the white, uh, reddish, and red and yellow. And it's so. going to be really pretty. And so more soil. So just kind of layer on layer on layer. Yep. Okay, next we have a smaller daffodil called tete a and these are really tiny. Those are fun to put around the edges now. Okay, and here's another one. Another pointy nose. Yep. And and don't worry about it. The only you want to make sure that your bulb is nice and firm. Okay. And you don't have to worry about the skins or anything. You okay. just need to make sure it's firm. If it's already soft, then it's uh, don't put it in there. Okay. Okay. Because sometimes that happens. Yep. All right. And to get your bulb soon is the the best way to avoid any problems with bulbs. And you know, at all the independent garden centers, they have so much selection in bulbs. Okay, and then we have the last, we have crocus, which are small, and they only get maybe five to six inches. Yeah, so we're going to keep those kind of to the top. Okay. And they're usually the first ones in the spring to come out and peek out. They're so much fun to have. It's really easy to put all these uh, bulbs in here, but I see that you have one that's already finished with just really fall pansies and another mm -hmm. plant. Fall pansies will do well for quite a while, even after a little frost. They're really easy. Mm -hmm. Also, there's one there with just a single plant in it. You know, that's really easy too. So if you're really nervous the first time you do it, keep it as simple as possible, which is one plant and some fall bulbs. And now here we have some just fall color for this container. I have a New Zealand flax and a Cape fuchsia. What else you have there? Isn't this gorgeous? Look at that. That'll finish out that pot. And you know, if we have some just mild weather, these will really just keep nice through the end of the fall. And I love that you have some really fancy violas here just to kind of finish it off. That'll brighten it up and it'll be a fall planter that'll be gorgeous for quite a while and then spring bulbs will come through those. You know, really make sure that this gets watered during the fall and you're in the winter time and you're really good to go. Well, thank you so much, it's just beautiful. Thank you. We have close to 40 acres in pumpkins now. Every year it seems to get a little bigger. We add one more attraction. We've done the rope swing. I'm going to shoot some apples. 
We have a brand new laser adventure and our bug trains have always been a big hit. We have all these greenhouses and come October, we fill them with all different kinds of activities. A dark hay maze, we have a hay obstacle course, we have a kid's hay maze. There's something for everybody. Little kids, big kids, everywhere and in between. Standard TV and Appliance is the place to buy luxury appliances and more. I agree. At Standard, I got the best selection, best price, and the best service. Standard carries top brands like Wolf, Sub-Zero, Decor, Gen Air, GE, and KitchenAid with great deals on washers, dryers, ranges, and more. Shopping at Standard is a slam dunk. Setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and Appliance. Fall is the best time to reconnect with your garden. Let Blooming Junction refresh your garden, your palate, and your soul for the cooler days ahead. Come take advantage of our fantastic selection of perennials at 35% off. Our gorgeous high fiber pottery is 40% off. It's the best time to plant and our best sell of the year. So come connect with nature and discover beauty at every turn. And enjoy the freshest produce grown organically right here on the farm. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Well, I am in Hillsboro and I'm at Clean Water Services and I'm standing in this wonderfully unique building with, with Brett here. And Brett, this is a place that is doing a lot of, of resource recovery and from that, that science and logic comes a type of fertilizer. So I want to know about this, but really I want to know, first of all, what is this product? What is it made of? And then how does that process come into being? Yeah, uh, the, the product itself is called Crystal Green. That's what we make here on site. Um, we also have a commercial product called Clean Water Grow that we're distributing locally. Um, but the Crystal Green itself is very a very, very pure type of fertilizer. So this is unlike any phosphorus-based fertilizers or slow-release fertilizers that you may see in stores. It's actually only uh, releases its nutrients when the roots need it. So I would love to hear about this process of, of where it comes from and how it, it happens. Sure, so here at this facility, we treat about 35 million gallons of wastewater every day. Mm -hmm. um, when that wastewater comes in, our main purpose is to separate out what humans have put into that water and yeah. take it out of the water, make the water clean again, but all those solids that we remove, we have to do something with. Sure. So we take those solids, and we put them in an anaerobic digester where they break down and become a usable biosol that can be land applied you okay. know, for, for fertilizer on fields. But the byproduct of that is all this water that we squeeze out of those biosolids. Uh -huh. So this water that comes out of the biosolids still has a lot of nutrients in it. It's got a lot of ammonia, lots of phosphorus. So traditionally we'd have to be really careful about recycling and retreating that water here at the site. Um, with this process, this uh, OSTAR process, we can take that high strength side stream waste, put it into these fluidized bed reactors, and inside the fluidized bed reactors, if you get the pH right, you can actually precipitate out uh, what is called struvite. And these little struvite pellets are just magnesium, ammonia, and phosphorus in a one-to-one -to -one -to -one molar ratio. These little, these little fertilizer pearls that we make in these reactors are actually more pure, a more pure source of phosphorus-based fertilizer than the stuff we would traditionally get out of the ground, say in Florida, at the phosphate mine. Because from the ground, there's all their stuff that's happening there, exactly. but here it's through a, a very clean system. It's a very controlled yeah. chemical reaction that only leaves room for those three constituents. So once these come out, then where do they go? So these guys will get, they'll come out of the reactor and go through a fluidized bed dryer. Um, that fluidized bed dryer will use waste heat that we've generated here on site nice. to heat the air to dry the product. And then we'll fill these one ton sacks off to a fertilizer blender and then onto the end user. And you know, the fascinating thing here is speaking of fertilizers, now we're gonna go visit a native nursery and they actually use this growing their natives and sending them out and, and where they place them. So thank you so much, this is fascinating. Yeah. I really yeah, appreciate your you time. For, thank you for coming. Okay, now we have come over to a native nursery and first of all, I'm gonna talk with you, Mac. Uh, tell me about 
how this is, this is the product in its retail packaging, right? That's right. So we take the crystal green that you saw being produced at the Rock Creek treatment plant and we mix it with a slow release nitrogen source and potash. So we have a full spectrum, all purpose plant food called Clean Water Grow. And the reason that you really like this is because it has, it, it's different than what fertilizers are, especially where there's watershed and rivers involved, isn't it? Yeah, so we don't experience any leaching or runoff with nice. this product, which makes it perfect for a situation where you're close to a stream or a lake. And it, it is more completely used than regular fertilizers. That's right. Uh, up to 80% of the actual fertilizer material is taken up by the plant. Nice. nice. And so now I'm going to switch over here to Bruce. Bruce, how are you? Very good, thank so you. So now tell me who you are and, and what part you play in this. I'm the Director of Watershed Management for Clean Water Services, and you're out at the Tualatin River Farm that serves as a staging area for our native plant giveaway with all the 12 cities of Washington County. Nice, so nice. So you'll look at 52 different varieties of native plants out here, and these go out to all of our city partners every year to be planted. And th there's a lot of things you do besides just just have the nursery here, but some of this stuff here you do grow, some you bring in, but it's all native for this area. It's all native, and Grow has found its niche in helping get these plants off to the right start. That phosphorus source helps the roots get really strong so that when we transfer them into their new homes, they will be much stronger and vigorous. And you really like this, this product because you really have to pay attention to everything that affects the whole culture of this area natively, don't you? Right, and like the program that we do where we're planting these riparian areas with native plants, we're looking for solutions that are local, yeah. locally derived, sustainable, and help create a resilient watershed. So linking the fertilizer with our native plant propagation is a natural fit in terms of moving the whole circle from you know beginning to end. And, it, and you're very comfortable now that you know that that the effect you're having is a positive one. It's really doing good changes long It's term. amazing, you know, this program paired with the Tree for All program yeah. has done more than two million plants in one year. Amazing. And over a million every year. And that's a reflection of people's passion for the environment as well as the desire to plant these plants throughout the basin. Well, you know, one of the things that I love about Oregon is how much we care about our nature itself and what we do to it and the effect we have on it. So for more information on any of these things, you can go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you to the appropriate websites and get out all the information you need and then pick up some grow for yourself. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank you for watching today and remember there's limited seats available to join William and I in Hawaii in February of 2017. It's going to be fun in the sun plus lots of gardens to see. So for more information on this great trip or to find out something you think you might want to re-watch on the show today, you can go to Gardentime.tv. William and I thank you for watching and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. Aloha! Aloha. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.